Hello and welcome to this lunchtime session uh, at the Insurance Post Claims and Fraud Summit. Um, again, I'd like to thank our sponsors, um, the Chartered Institute Loss Assessors, Davis Group, E2E, Total Loss Vehicle Management, Kennedy's and Verisk. I remind you that the uh, networking platform umbrella is open till Tuesday and if you want to set up a meeting, you can do that by using the People tab on the platform. So we come to this session, which is a fireside chat around the subject of COVID-19 injury claims and floodgates, looking at the impact of the pandemic on injury claims. And I'm delighted to join me for this session. We have James Shrimpton, a partner at Kennedy's, working in its liability team. Uh, welcome, James. Hi, uh, Jonathan. How are you? Good. I'm fine. Thank you very much. Um, me and James are going to have a chat, but um, if you do want to pose a question to James at any point or want to kind of comment on anything we're talking about, then please use the chat function on your screen. Um, if you use that chat function, We'll come to these uh, at some point during the conversation. So, James, can I just ask you, first of all, can you outline the legal basis on which someone might bring a COVID-19 infection claim and under what protocols would they fall? OK, well, the uh, I think there are sort of a couple of routes for, for bringing claims, both um, employers' liability claims and also public liability claims, members of the public uh, and others as well. So. Um, the probably the starting point is um, going really back to first principles and looking at whether or you know, whether a duty is owed, which is obviously a straightforward issue for an employee, uh, for a member of the public visiting business premises. Again, they can uh, they can quite easily show that. Um, where it perhaps gets a bit a little bit more complicated is where we're looking at um, people who are one step removed from uh, from visitors to premises. So. Uh, an employee's you know, spouse or partner who has been infected when that employee comes home and, and shares COVID around his household. So that, that I think is one, one area where we may actually see, uh, see some claims arising. The next issue actually is, is what, what is the duty that's owed? Um, and it's, it's not an absolute duty, it's a duty to take reasonable care. So it, it's the same duty that is owed um, to any employee or to to any visitor, but it's then adapted by um, uh, you know, by by specific events relevant to that business, and I think we have to we have to take into account um, what has happened over the last you know nine ten months or so, because we have we have not had a you know, a static situation. If you go back and if you look at uh, what happened. Um, in you know 23rd of March, we all suddenly go into lockdown, and the position since then has um, evolved, and it's evolved regularly. Uh, we had a couple of months where only essential businesses were allowed to open. We then had a relaxing of um, you know of, of those uh, arrangements. Schools start to go back, non-essential businesses and shops open. Um, people are allowed to go to pubs from the 4th of July and go away on holiday again. So you can see actually there's quite a fluid environment there. And throughout this time, the government has been providing um, evolving advice to sectors. Um, a lot of this focus is, of course, on, on risk assessment. So businesses are required to risk assess their own you know, particular undertaking. And um, you know, and then put in place measures which broadly reflect um, issues such as social distancing uh, and hygiene. You know, keeping your premises clean and ensuring that people are you know washing their hands and uh, and putting antibacterial hand gel. But then, over overlaid on top of that, there is additional information uh, for certain sectors such as care homes, you know, pubs. Um, and and the NHS as well, and that the duty will be informed by you know, what what government guidance is in play at that particular time when the alleged infection occurred. So it, it's it's not like looking back with a you know is there a guard on a machine? <laughs> you know this this is a you know, quite a fluid uh, a fluid environment there. So. We, we have the whole issue of, you know, is there a duty? What's that duty? Has that duty actually um, been breached at all? Um, so we'll have to have to sort of look into into that. And of course, that can be that can be quite a you know, a challenging exercise because um, when you when you look at the um, epidemiology of the 
disease. This is um, this is a condition which generally becomes symptomatic five to six days um, after one is infected. But um, that's not really the end of it because you know, the, the range is between one and 14 days. So it's sometimes quite difficult to tell when an individual was actually infected. Were they infected you know, on, you know, on a particular day at a place of work or was that infection in fact you know caught somewhere else on a different day so there's no there's no easy way of working that out which i think cuts both ways for you know defendants employers and uh, you know uh, and their insurers um, but it also can give rise to a bit of a uh, bit of scope for confusion on the on the claimant side so we, you know, we sort of looked at that, and of course, the claimant has to show that the breach caused the, you know, the injury. And causation, I think, is going to be a massive, a massive issue. It's going to be a real hurdle for claimants. Um, but I think, as we may go on to discuss, uh, it it can also provide a bit of a headache, I think, for uh, defendants and their and their insurers, which we, you know, we need to be alive to, so we can we can manage that. Um, and finally, of course, they, you know. That, that that breach uh, has got to have caused injury and, that, and the injury has to be an actionable one because um, we, we've seen that you know COVID causes a very, very wide range of outcomes. It can range from being completely asymptomatic. So question actually, is that even actionable at all? Is Are we in the, you know, the realm of plural plaques you know, in England and Wales where you can't recover anything for it? You know, right up to the worst possible outcome with complications where there's, you know, where there's death. So there's quite a wide range of, of outcomes there. So it, it is quite a quite an interesting, quite a fluid um, environment on on liability. Certainly scope to uh, to bring a claim, and not straightforward, but enough there to cause you know to cause us a few headaches on the way if we don't manage it right from the outset. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot my uh, my mic again. There you go. That's about the third time today. <laughs> James, I mean, you talk about that kind of headaches. I mean, should employers be worried about the potential liability to to these types of claims? I, I think it's I think it's not being unduly worried, but I, I think that there is a real risk that there could be floodgates um, if these aren't managed properly from the you know from the outset when they start start to come in too. You know, to employers and uh, you know, and their insurers, uh, I think there are pretty good grounds for defending the vast majority of these cases and pushing back on them. I think causation is going to be extremely, extremely difficult for uh, for claimants, um, and I, I think generally li liability. Um, when you when you overlay this against you know, what's happened you know, in the outside world, you know, businesses have either shut down for the early part, so that will cut out some elements of claims. Lots of businesses have actually been very compliant. They've put in place you know, one-way systems. You know, I can see that both of us are working from home at the minute, Jonathan. So um, you know, we have, you know, we, we've sort of moved into an environment away from that. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think that there is, you know, there, there is real, real scope for um, for some mischief uh, to be caused further down the line. Um, yeah, so it's, it, I think it, it is a challenge, and I think one of one of the things to be alive to is that I think these cases will fall under the disease protocol, um, which gives a particular benefit to uh, claimant firms because. They will be hourly rate claims if they drop out of the, you know, the claims portal. A lot of these will actually start in the claims portal because most of them will be very low value claims. Um, people's symptoms generally last two or three weeks, uh, and you know, thankfully, most people make a full recovery. Um, and what I think we may see is, uh, you know, an issue of whether, you know whether insurers decide to do you pay the claims keep them in the portal um or do you push back um let it drop out of the portal become a you know potentially a higher higher value claim in terms of claimants costs um uh, but then you know defend it further down the line both on liability and causation 
sending a message out to the claimant market that you know these are not you know, this is this is not just a stick it in the portal we'll pay it um and i think that's probably a message that we've seen in the past with um you know say deafness claims there was a whole flood of those in the in the 2000s subsequently travel claims where the initial stance had been these these weren't worth very much pay a few and then suddenly you know there is an overwhelming number of claims coming through the claimant market sees a real opportunity to to develop that and uh, you know particularly if they're being disease hourly rate claims quite profitable if you can get them over the line um and you know uh, and then that causes a causes a problem there's a there's a real force and uh, you know uh, and some of the claimant market really know how to uh, you know how to take advantage of that so james can i ask i mean what can employers do to mitigate the risk to, to reduce their potential exposure exposure to these types of claims and that probably comes down to their duty of care with both employers and as you mentioned non-employers yeah and visitors. I, I think you know they're obviously following um following government guidance carrying out risk assessments so you are you know you're, you're identifying the areas where you can limit limit exposure um, and then making sure that those measures you've identified are, are actually implemented. So yeah, all very well doing a risk assessment. If you don't act on it and continue to act on it, um, an employer would leave themselves exposed. Uh, similarly, um, it's, it's enforcing that with with members of staff because you need to share that information. You need to get them to understand what they should be doing and why. Um, and if they are, if you have members of staff who are uh, you know, displaying symptoms or have been told through the track and trace system to self-isolate, well, they need to be doing that because the real, both an Achilles heel and a Trojan horse is, is the issue of vicarious liability, um, where a perfect employer who is, you know, it's, Done its risk assessment. It's you know it's implemented all the measures. It then has an employee coming in with COVID, infecting the rest of the workforce, infecting all the visitors to that premises, um, and opening the employer up vicariously for liability for that. Um, so undoing all the all the good work the employer has done. So I think that that's one element. Probably the other bit is actually the defensibility because um, claimants will have have three years to bring these claims. And as we've touched on it, it's not like a straightforward um, you know, injury case where someone cuts their finger on a machine. You know the time of day, uh, you know the hour, you probably even know the minute when that happened. Here, you could be looking at a, you know, a two week period. So you're trying to amass information about what happened um, over an evolving, you know, period of months anyway, with risk assessments and you know measures being put in place, what actually happened on the ground on that particular day, two days, three days, up to fourteen days, um, and you're having to do that, you know, a couple of years down the line. That 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 could be the practical difficulty. So trying to collate that information at this stage will then help them. And their insurers defend things further down the tracks. So, can I ask James, um, based on what's come out so far, how does the current medical research evidence stack up in terms of being able to predict how successful otherwise these claims are likely to be? I suppose this is the crux of the matter, really, isn't it? Yeah. Um, well, as you, you know, as you've sort of touched upon, this is a developing area of um, medical knowledge. And um, I, I think we're not quite at the final stage yet where we know everything about it, where we can confidently predict how it's going to play out in a, in a medico legal context. You know, people are more interested, yeah, and it's pro probably right, even if a lawyer says it, in, in actually what's going on on the ground, getting this sorted. Um, but you know, our discussions with some, uh, with some of the medical experts involved in the research on this suggests that um, we are we are looking at um, uh, obviously the more you're exposed to the virus the greater the risk you have of developing the condition that that makes sense um, what they have said though is that 
um, just because you're exposed to more virus doesn't mean that the you know, the extent of the condition is worse. So if I drew the analogy you know, with, is this like a deafness case where the more noise you're exposed to, it all causes injury, but the greater the exposure, the greater the level of injury. Um, the indication is it's not like that. It's more akin to potentially a mesothelioma claim where it just takes one, you know, one bit of you know, pathogen to cause your infection. So the more you're exposed, obviously, the more chance that you will get, uh, you know, you will develop COVID due to, you know, you know, a, a particular pathogen. Um, but um, that, I think, will actually make it more difficult for a claimant to succeed on causation. We are if we want to get technical and back into, uh, you know, in, into <laughs> causation issues, simple but for test, but for, you know, the defendant's negligence, would you have developed COVID? And I think that's probably where we sit at the minute uh, based on, on that, you know, that legal uh, and that medical analysis. Um, for the claimant to, to show that actually they are um, having to, you know, th their risk has been increased, um, we would be moving more towards the, the fair child approach for causation, um, which is frankly probably, a, you know, a, I think probably a step too far. And that was obviously very, very specific to mesothelioma claims where see, the employer is, is introducing a, a dangerous product into its workplace, i.e. asbestos, as opposed to a pathogen which is all over the country at the moment. So, um, so I, th I think that, there's, that, that there is positive things there. Um, the, I think what we are seeing, though, um, increasing reports of um, longer term symptoms. Well, obviously, we have very acute symptoms where people are um, having to be put on ventilators, and, you know, and that, that that's understandably leading to some very, you know, significant um, outcomes. Even for those who you know who, who manage to uh, make it through that that particularly acute stage. Um, you know, if you've been intubated, um, th then there are going to be a number of long-term uh, long-term issues there. But even those who've not been hospitalised are reporting in in you know, a not insignificant number of cases. It's probably you know, sort of five to ten percent long long COVID symptoms. You know, the brain fog, the sort of um, you know aches, pains, uh, which we see in in quite a few of the sort of the chronic almost the chronic pain type conditions and I, th I think that is probably where some of the higher value claims will will come in in, in due course they will be a smaller bit um, i mean i know this is very early day, days james but i mean are we seeing enough activity around covid-19 to indicate that insurers can expect a trickle to become something larger in terms of claims and what are your observations around quantum potential claims? You did mention earlier that a number of these would yeah. end up in the portal because of their well. Their I, I suppose in numbers, in terms of numbers at the minute, um, we have um, speaking with our you know, insurer clients, we've seen quite a lot of notifications where you know, there have been either you know, outbreaks of COVID in various you know, various workplaces or in social settings. I think you'll have seen lots of reporting on the news. Um, care homes obviously have been incredibly hard hardly hit um and uh, so so i think that there there have been a very significant number of notifications by insureds to insurers uh on on that front in terms of claims coming through at the minute though that hasn't hasn't yet started we've started to see a few claims but not large numbers of them and i think there's there's probably a few reasons for that um Firstly, when you look at the uh, you look at the claimant solicitors' websites and the advertising, they really aren't mentioning this at the moment. There there are a couple of small players, and there are there's the odd one or two larger players. You know, um, a large London firm does does mention this on their advertising, but none of the uh, other national claimant firms are at the minute actively pushing this, um, and we may be seeing, because of course, quite a few claimant firms had to furlough staff. Um, they are focusing on their existing caseload. We've obviously seen um, quite a drop off in litigation coming through at the minute as claimant firms try and 
manage that at the courts, try and manage manage that, and also um, try to get medical experts to see claimants. So I, I think there is a focus on dealing with existing case loads rather than rather than that. There may also be a bit of an issue as to is it too is it too early? Is it you know is it poor taste to be talking about claims at this stage? Flip side as well, claimants. Um, the furlough scheme has just been extended. You know, for the sake of a couple of thousand pounds, three thousand pounds for a claim, do you want to be marking yourself out as the person who made a claim against your employer? Um, and when we start to see you know, larger levels of uh, of redundancy, which I think unfortunately is is perhaps inevitable at, at some point, um, then we will we will start to see those flooding through into the you know, into the claimant market. So it, it, I think it, I think it will come, um, but I don't think it's there yet. And I don't think everyone has got their head around, you know, the route that they can take. They've got other other focuses at the moment. Um, pro- probably the other thing then that you touched upon was was the value of these cases. Uh, and uh, I think the you know, the World Health Organization and uh, the, you know, the, the UK Chief Medical Officer, Chris Whitty, both of both of them said that about 80% of these cases are going to be ones that don't involve hospitalisation. That Those are the symptomatic cases, because, of course, we have a whole raft of asymptomatic cases as well. Uh, and most of those are resolving within, you know, within a few weeks. So people self-isolate for a couple of weeks, probably back at work. Very, if anything, is there going to be much care? It's going to be a very small you know, a small figure, less than five thousand pounds, and as I say, that will that will start in the portal, um, and and it will be dealt with in the fast track if it's not resolved before that stage. Where I think we have much more potential, though, is um, you know, predominantly in these sort of longer term, you know, chronic you know chronic conditions, long COVID, uh, and people who are. Um, who've had to go in and, you know, uh, into intensive care, have made it out, and there are perhaps longer term care needs as well. Obviously, it affects a, uh, you know, you're more at risk the older you are, and that is the primary fact, yeah, the primary issue there, going back to the medical side. So we are looking at a, an older population. So for, for a number of those, it it won't be a, a question of, um, you know, a loss of earnings claim. It may be a question of actually significant care package. Uh, if they can show that, so I, I think those are the those are some of the main areas there on the you know on the quantum side, but quite a wide quite a right wide range, not just uh, not just low value, unfortunately. So, I, I can I ask then, James? I mean, you touched on this the fact that you know um, that you, you haven't perhaps seen the the claims come through yet, but do you fear CMCs and their neighbours clogging up the system with a load of unmeritorious COVID nineteen claims? I do hear that. In Birmingham, where I understand you work, that a number of businesses have been actually leaflet dropped. You know, the, these premises that are currently, you know, perhaps empty or, or, or businesses. <laughs> I don't know. You, you hear these stories, yeah. but, but it always does seem to be all perhaps on the on the, the gossip grapevine, perhaps rather than the reality. But I, I don't know if if you have fears or any you have any anecdotes about about this happening. Well, obviously, when I when I go back into the office in you know in three or four months' time, and I I've got to sort of push past all these leaflets, I'll be yeah. <laughs> We're very nervous, but I, I think it's it's a very very valid point, and I I, I do have concerns for this because um, the fr- from a legal perspective, in terms of the steps the claimant has got to go through, it's quite arduous. But then when you think actually, what does the claimant the claimant solicitor need to do to get a claim off the ground and really push the burden onto the you know onto the employer, onto the insured, onto the insurer? Well, it's a letter of claim. It's a CNF, a claims notification form. And then the employer has to and the insured has to investigate that. They've got to respond on liability. Um, And if they don't um, and if they don't provide substantial disclosure to back up any denial of liability, then, you know, and we've we've seen this happen in the travel sector. They get hit with pre-action disclosure applications, you know, asking for, you know, Risk assessments. You know, we want all the, you know, the, you know, the medical surveillance on who's been sent home, when, um, and and that soon soon mounts up, and it puts, you know, it, it puts the unwary defendant, the unwary insurer, on the back foot, um, and that's when I think some of the unmeritorious claims 
you know could get could get through if people if people panic on that so um so i think that is the real area and i think if you know thinking about you know strategies for dealing dealing with these and getting it clear in your head what what a claimant is required to do and what you know you can do as a as a defendant as an insurer to um you know work with your insured so that they are capturing information now to help you push back on these and also so you are going back to the claimants and saying well you, you said you said you developed uh, you know uh, symptoms due to due to our negligence well tell us tell us when exact circumstances what else yeah you know, what else you did did you did you go down to the supermarket did you go down the pub you know where else have you been in the last you know, you know the last two weeks so you, you, there could be a bit of uh, regaining the initiative there i think um but uh, it, it, it takes a bit of planning and if you if you're seeing this you know uh in isolation if you're trying to deal with these on on, on the hoof i think there'll be a lot of pressure uh, from the uh from the more sophisticated claimant firms when they get up and running <laughs> so james i mean finally i suppose i have to ask the question i mean what impact has the pandemic had on, on other injury claims i mean just to say there is other things going on during this time and, and what impact has COVID-19 had on those other claims that, you, that you've been handling? Well um, I think quantum is you know has has had a, a bit of a knock-on effect on it because we've seen claimants who are struggling to get access to medical treatment um, and so the the normal mitigation that you would see people being you know being treated for you know, fractures, um, having the physiotherapy, having the psychological input that you know, that would normally occur in some of those cases, um, that, that's become more problematic. And I think that uh, has the, has scope, and I've seen it on a number of cl- cases already, where you know, the claims value has gone up as a result. Um, we have the broader issue of the impact on the economy. Um, so companies that may previously have kept jobs open for people or being more willing to adapt uh, a job for someone returning from injury may not have that luxury anymore and people are then thrown onto the onto a ever increasingly competitive job market so i think that that is uh, that is a big concern um flip side actually we have seen some you know innovations in in people delivering um you know therapy you know uh, psychological treatment um you know over the web, which has been, uh, you know, been a very useful development, and and approaching it by um, taking on board more, more tools, more more tech, rather than having to have a support worker standing over an individual all the time. So I think there are there are positives on that. Um, I think the other side, obviously, the um, the effect on on claims going through the courts that's been delayed. We we are seeing um, virtual trials, which uh, you know, work, you know, better or worse. Um, there's lots of uh, virtual joint settlement meetings going on. Um, and we found that it's, it's been possible to, you know, to make offers to, you know, to claimants to move cases. And, you know, whilst claim solicitors may not feel that they've got all the information available to, you know, to advise on settlement, often their clients would like the money and don't want to wait for the, you know, 9, 10, 12, 12 months before they, before they get the cash. I think probably the other the other areas that we need to be alive to are see people are now working from home a lot more, and um, there's obviously the concern with both you know, mental health and you know uh, and sitting you know sitting working off your ironing board, people having musculoskeletal issues. Um, I think the other area as well is because we have actually had quite a fluid uh, you know time at work where people are perhaps changing you know working methods. Uh, you know, they may not have had a, a complete workforce. People are filling in for for other people's roles. Um, you know, the risk assessments, the training, the supervision just isn't keep isn't able to keep up with that. And so, I think that will have a you know to a lesser extent a knock on effect on on some of the you know the standard ELPL claims that we you know we regularly get. Um, so, you know, it's it's had a few consequences. I think it's fair to say, Jonathan. <laughs> James, thank you very much for your time. Unfortunately, we have uh, run out of, of time for the session, but I say thank you for sharing your insights into what is going to be, I think, a very interesting um, 
uh, area and subject um, over this coming years. Before I go, I'd just like to remind you all um, of the networking uh, platform umbrella. It will be open till Tuesday. Um, but if you want to kind of uh, make any meetings, use the people tab on that platform. So it'd be great to get networking. Uh, we can't meet in person. So uh, this is as probably about as good as it gets. So please use the Bella platform um, to go out there and networking. All that's left me to say is that we will return at 3.15 for session a whiplash update with delay and beyond what is the industry now expecting. But um, for myself, um, it's a goodbye. Cheerio.